my life to you, I give shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Amen. Well, with that, let's turn our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 10. The title of our study is Recovery After Rebellion. And we're going to actually be uh, looking at um, Matthew chapter 5 as well. So if you want to put a bookmark in Deuteronomy 10 and then maybe flip over to, to Matthew chapter 5, we'll, we'll start with that in just a minute. But kind of set up the scene here. Moses is now moving into a section where he's encouraging the people to obey the law, the Ten Commandments. And he's pleading with them to return to the Lord after Moses has, is, is going to be receiving the second pair of the Ten Commandments. And uh, when this happens, Israel is able to watch God deliver them and give them a new life with meaning and purpose. As I was thinking about that, I'm amazed what the Lord has done uh, in our lives. Uh, he took a handful of us meeting in my grandmother's home um, to where we are at today. I never would have imagined. And this summer will be 10 years as a church. It'll be 20 years of ministry for myself. Um, and then the end of the year in December will actually, I will be turning 40. So a lot of milestones in this year for me. Uh, my family's going to go to California for a couple of weeks. And that'll be the first time we'll be away from our church family for that long. So, um, but it'll be good uh, to revisit with family and and extended church family out in California, so looking forward to that. But just amazing to think that God can take your life and use it in ways you couldn't imagine. And I was sharing this with some of the guys a while ago, but I remember a time in my life where um, my dad here in Minnesota came out to California before I got saved, and I had made the comment to my dad because he invited us to go to Calvary Chapel, and I said, Dad, you know, I'd, I'd like to, but... I'm too busy for God. And little did I know about two weeks, three weeks later, um, God would get a hold of my heart. Ann and I went and saw the passion of Christ, and, and then we got plugged into uh, the youth group at Calvary Chapel, and, and one thing led to another, and we ended up giving our lives to the Lord. And, and I look back and I think, God, you have a good sense of humor. And that at that time, I said, I'm too busy for you. And now my whole life is about you right? And so be careful what you say, because God will hold you to that, right? Um, and so just amazing to think um, that God can use our life in ways we can't even imagine if we fully commit it to him, fully surrender it over to him. And, and I was thinking about that because that was exactly what Moses did. He was trying to deliver people on his own and didn't work well. And then about 40 years later, then he was ready and he led them in the wilderness and what J. Vernon McGee calls the, the, the back of the desert degree is what Moses got. Learning how to rely upon the Lord. And then he led the people. And so Moses was just getting started at this point, helping the next generation get ready to enter into the promised land and all the promises that God had for them. And I believe we're just getting started here. I think we are beginning to see another Revival, another Jesus revolution take place. That people are waking up to the reality that there is a God and that they're looking for something real, something genuine, uh, something that's, um, that's true. And people are discovering that there is a God and he loves them and they're learning more about Christ. And so I want to start off with Matthew chapter 5. And, and I want to start here because uh, the words of Christ, in essence, of talking about the law is where we need to really have our mindset as we deal with things in the Old Testament. And I love what he says here. This is uh, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 17 and 18. He says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law 
or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For sure they say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And that jot and that tittle is like, we would say, you know, you, you cross your T and you dot your I, right? He's saying, not even that is going to be removed. So Christ makes it very clear. He did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. And um, if you've tried to live the Ten Commandments, you'll realize pretty quickly you cannot do it on your own. You will fail. And, and the law is like a mirror. We've talked about this. It shows us our sinfulness. And sin is often like bad breath, right? Easy to detect it on others, not so easy to detect it on ourselves, right? You know, you ask your spouse, yeah, okay, okay, yep, yeah, you, you know, you need to check that. So that's what the law is. It's a mirror. It shows us like, okay, I'm, I'm okay maybe over here, but man, I got some spots over here, some blemishes. And the Lord says, come to me. I can cleanse you. I can, I can make you whole. And so I'm thankful that Jesus fulfilled the whole law. He grants his righteousness unto us as a free gift. The only way that we can keep the law is if we're in Christ, right? It's through Christ. He's kept the law perfectly. If we're not in him, there's no way. And, and the reality is, again, we, there's probably a few times where we're like 10 seconds, we're doing great, and then we think, oh, I'm, I'm doing awesome, and then we realize, oh, that's pride. Okay, I just sinned again. So we realize that Christ is perfect, right? He never once sinned. And so I want us to have this framework as we realize that uh, the things of the Old Testament are still for us today, right? The moral law does not change. Uh, this is eternal. And so when there's people that say, well, I'm a good person, you know, I, I, I'm a nice guy, and God's going to grade on a curve and let me in, the reality is he's not, right? If you transgress the law, you're a sinner, and you need God's forgiveness. So God doesn't grade on a curve, but he grades on the cross, if you've accepted him and what he's done for you, you're in. So when you get to heaven and you're not there boasting, well, you know, because I'm such a good person, that's why I'm here. You're there because you're like, it's only what Jesus has done for me. It's all about him. So I want us to have that framework as we start here in chapter 10. Um, again, Israel has just sinned. So if you want to make your way back to Deuteronomy 10, Israel just blew it and... Um, Moses, we saw last time, was the only one who broke all Ten Commandments at once. He threw them down, upset at the people, and so now we'll see he's going to go back up the mountain for another 40 days and get the second uh, pair of the tablets. And so we'll pick that up here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, and we'll look at the uh, first 11 verses uh, together. If I butcher some of the places, forgive me. If you know Hebrew better than me, then... Uh, maybe I'll let you say him instead. So, at that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. Come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I'll write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood and hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Benia, um, Yaakin, to Morsra, where Aaron died, and where he was buried. And Eleazar, his son, ministered as priest in his stead. From there they journeyed to Gugada, and from Gugada to Yotbatha, a land of rivers. At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord to stand before him, to minister to him, and bless his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren, 
The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. Verse 10. As at the first time I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. We'll pause there. We see that Moses went up the mountain to receive a second set of the Ten Commandments. God's holy law, right? That we should have God first and foremost in our life. Uh, serve him only. That we shouldn't have idols in our life, false gods. That we should watch our words and we should not use the Lord's name in vain. That we're to honor the Sabbath, to keep it holy. And, and our Sabbath, we find in the New Testament, is in Christ Jesus. And then to honor our father and our mother. It's the only commandment with a promise. So, young ones in here, take heed. Listen to mom and dad, you're going to have a longer life. They, they're a little bit smarter than you may think they are, okay? They've been around the earth a few more times than you, so heed their wisdom. It'll go well with you. And then the sixth one is that we should not uh, murder. It's not against killing, it's against murdering people. Uh, the seventh is you shall not commit adultery. A mom and dad should stay together forever. Number eight is you shouldn't steal. Number nine is you shouldn't lie, bear false witness. And number 10, you shouldn't covet. You shouldn't desire what other people have. Be content with what God has given you. So Moses, we see, brings these two blank flat uh, tablets this time, and God begins to write on them with his finger. You could say Moses was the first man with a tablet to download files from the cloud, right? <laughs> he was way ahead of technology. <laughs> and so he is there receiving God's law, God's instruction, the second time, and he's bringing these tablets back to the people. And, and God's revealing how holy he is before the people. There are some people who try and say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and law, and the God of the New Testament is a God of love and mercy. The reality is it's the same God. Uh, it's the exact same gracious and kind God that's in both Testaments. And fortunately, people see two gods, but there's, there's one God, he's consistent. About 282 years ago, Jonathan Edwards, uh, a preacher, gave a sermon called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Maybe you've heard that title. There was a little book that was made uh, later on of his sermon. And it actually sparked a revival in 1741. We call it the First Great Awakening. People began to call on the name of the Lord and, and realize that they needed his mercy and his forgiveness. Sadly, some today think that the wrath of God is an uncomfortable contradiction to the love of Christ. The love of Christ is so important. And it's so precious, precisely because we realize how wretched and sinful we are. So unworthy of anything but God's wrath but he gives us grace instead. In fact, Jonathan Edwards, it's, it's said that as he was giving that sermon, he was interrupted many times by people who were asking, what shall I do to be saved? How many times have you heard a pastor give a message where he gets interrupted? Hey, excuse me, um, how can I get saved? I mean, that's, that's the heart of, of what was going on. The people were desiring, I, I'm not right with Lord, the Lord. You're talking about me, and, and, and he's going to judge me. How do I get right? And so there were people who um, today think that the God of the New Testament is soft. Um, and sadly, they often don't read the book of Revelation. Because uh, if you did, you'd realize he's a God of justice. And he is a perfect and fair judge. Um, but he's going to uh, bring wrath upon the world of those who reject him. But for those of us who love him, we're going to be raptured out. We're going to be with him in paradise. So we see that God is consistent. And we realize that, as we see in those song, Amazing Grace, we're the wretch the song refers to, right? And it, we just realize how amazing his grace is that he would save someone like us to rescue us because he lavishes his love upon us. 
some have called this crazy love. I think um, there was a pastor, what was it, uh, Francis Chan wrote a book on that once. It's, it's that indescribable love that God has for us. Right? A love that uh, can seem crazy to some people. It's a love that God has for his creation, that he would want a relationship with us. And so we see that uh, God wanted his people to have his written word, his law. And this would be the starting point of Israel's right walk with them. They had returned back to the instructions of the Lord. To get right with God again, they had to return back to his word. And so God commanded the giving of these new tablets. This is also recorded in Exodus chapter 34, which we've looked at. It reminds me that there are things that God has written for us. And sometimes people will say, well, I don't know about that. We should just skip over that book. And um, it's been amazing to see people wanting to come as we've been studying the word of God. And I was sharing that at a previous ministerial meeting we had with other pastors in the community. And they were asking, where are you on the Bible? And I said, well, right now we're in Leviticus. And they were all laughing. They thought it was a joke. And I'm like, no, we're actually studying the book of Leviticus. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, and people are coming. You know, that's, that was the amazing thing. And so we don't want to skip over things in the Bible that God has for us. In fact, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, all scripture, not some scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it's God's word that equips us. It's God's word that sets us on that right path again towards him. Pastor David Guzek said, getting right with God after a time of rebellion must always have a focus on the priestly ministry of Jesus on our behalf. This work of Jesus is shown in his atonement for our sin at the cross, on his intercession for us in heaven, and the blessing that he brings to us from heaven. So Israel had just committed a sin. Uh, they had made this golden calf, which we talked about, uh, this holy cow that they made, where Aaron said, I just threw the gold in and pop, this thing came out. And, and so the people had sinned against God at Mount Sinai. And it was significant. It was no small matter. Yet God was not done with them. God still had a plan for Israel. And they came back to him through his word and through the priesthood. It was a time for them to not dwell on their sin, but receive God's grace and move on. And God had a place to take them. He wanted to bring them into the promised land, into the promises that he had for them. I think sometimes we can get stuck where we're at. God wants us to move on with him as well. Move onward in the Lord. When we're walking right with God again, we're then reflecting his light and his truth to those around us. And God has a plan for our lives as well. He gives us second chances and third and fourth and many, 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 many more. Right? He's a gracious and forgiving God. And, and I'm grateful that he does that. That's not a punch card with like uh, 10 opportunities. And God said, oh, well, you were at number nine and you just punched your 10th sin, you're done. No, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. God's, God's very forgiving towards us. And uh, I'm very gracious for that. that. He gives us many chances, many opportunities to repent and come back and, and keep our eyes upon him. And so next we'll see what God desires from us. We'll see what God desires for Israel in this new relationship and we'll uh, apply that to ourselves as well and see what, what does God desire for us in our relationship with him. And we'll see that here in verse 12 and uh, we'll go through verse 16. He says, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth, 
with all that's in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. We'll pause there. We see that this section begins with the question, what does the Lord your God require of you? And we see that he requires of his people that we fear the Lord our God. That is to trust him, to have reverence towards him, that he is holy, to respect him, to love him. And again, it's hard to trust someone you don't know, right? I I think I've used this illustration before that if I was at Walmart and I needed to do something and, and, and I said, hey, hold on to my wallet, I'll be right back, and I gave it to a stranger, probably wouldn't go. I don't know this person. I may not get that back. Maybe I will. Maybe there'll be no money in it. I don't, I don't know them. I can't trust them. But if I saw one of you guys and I said, hey, can you hold this real, real quick? I just got to go do this. I'll come right back. It's going to be there because I know you guys. I trust you, right? And so as we get to know the Lord, we begin to put more trust in him. We're going to see, oh, God, you are gracious. You are kind. You are forgiving. You're merciful. So we grow in that knowledge and understanding of who the Lord is. And so we realize that we can fear him. We can trust him and honor him in a way that pleases him. We can love him and then serve him with all of our heart and our soul. And as we do that, we obey the scriptures and we enjoy a blessed life in fellowship with God, walking in a way that pleases him, following Jesus. That is great if we do that. If we don't, we could do what verse 16 says. You can be stiff-necked, which is to be obstinate and difficult to lead. The Israelites were familiar with this term, having coming from an agricultural society. The farmers would have understood the frustration of trying to plow a field or transport a a cart with oxen that were being stiff-necked that refused to go in the direction that they wanted it to go, to be guided and, and then failing at the task that they were intended to perform. So God gets a hold of that picture and he's using that to illustrate the way that Israel had been. What's interesting in the New Testament, Acts chapter seven, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, actually uses the same kind of illustration. He uses the term stiff-necked when he concludes his defense for the gospel and told the Jews they had murdered their Messiah. In Acts 7, he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. They didn't really appreciate that as much as they should have, and and sadly, they, they stoned and killed Stephen. Um, One of the people that was there holding the coats, we know later on, was Saul of Tarsus. Um, Like God would get a hold of his heart and change it. He'd become uh, known as Paul the Apostle. And later on, in fact, he would almost give the same summary of Israel's history that Stephen did. And so their stubbornness to accept Jesus as the Messiah showed they failed to listen to the prophets who foretold the coming of the Messiah. As Jesus said, all the scriptures speak of him. They point to him. It's all about Jesus. He's the suffering servant for us. So God wants us to change our minds about his word and what he has for us. Let him change our hearts. And this is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, right? To pay the penalty for us, our rebellion of sin, that he died on the cross for us. He shed his life's blood for you and for me. And then he rose from the grave. He defeated death. All the other religions of the world, their founders are still in the ground. They're dead. They're buried. But you go to Israel, one of the, my kids asked me the the other day, where's the tomb of Jesus? I said, they don't know. And the body's not there, right? He's, He's alive. He, after his resurrection, he was on earth for about 40 days, and then he ascended back into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. And so we see that Jesus has overcome. 
He can change our stubborn hearts and the hearts that seek after him. As I was thinking about this, at the same time as we're walking in the Lord, we must care more about what God thinks about us than what other people think about us. And I know that could be hard for some of us. We are people pleasers and peacemakers, so we don't want to rock the boat and ruffle the feathers. But there are times where God says, I need you to stand for truth and for righteousness. And not everyone's going to like that. And I think one of the things we have to be cautious about is caring more about what God thinks, and what God desires than what man around us thinks. For example, God has told us in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us being saved, it is the power of God. If we call Jesus our Lord, which he is, we should be obedient to that call to go and proclaim the good news, to do what he says, to have a heart at least desire to want to see people come to know the Lord. But when we say, Lord, I know what your word says, but I'm going to pray about it instead. We're really being disobedient in that, Lord, I know I should be doing this, but... I'm not going to, and I still want to appear somewhat right, so I'm just going to pray instead about being obedient. And um, the reality is, when we disobey the Lord, we're a bad witness, just like Israel was. God had called them to be obedient, and there were times where they said, no, we're going to do it our way. Most, I think, don't share the good news because they want to appear foolish, talking about the blood of somebody on a wooden cross and that this person came back from the dead and, and it could make him look like a fool. Uh, Bill Bright with Campus Crusade years ago found that only 2% of Christians were actively sharing their faith with words. I think a major lack of obedience in this area is due to fear. Fear of what other people are gonna think of me, what other people are gonna say. And I think another obstacle is lack of focus. We're so focused on self and other things that we forget to focus on the Lord and where he has placed us to reach those around us. And so as I was thinking about that in my own salvation, I gotta be honest, I'm very thankful someone told me about Christ. I had heard the gospel many times, but the way that they put it made sense to me that day and I, I felt like I was the only one in the room who needed Christ. And, and when our associate pastor uh, mentioned that, what Christ had done for us, it was like, thank you, Jesus, that you would do that for somebody like me and that you would love me and forgive me. And so we began to realize that someone was obedient to the Lord. They told us the good news. We want to make sure that we're obedient to the Lord and and we have a desire to want to reach those around us. And so Moses is warning the people to get this message, to not forget that obedience to the Lord is key to every blessing in Christ. Unfortunately, the same spiritual blindness is with us today. There are many people that believe that things such as baptism or confirmation or church membership or participation in the Lord's Supper automatically guarantees salvation. It doesn't. As meaningful as some of those things are, the Christian's assurance and seal of salvation isn't a physical ceremony. It's the spiritual work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives, taking that heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh, causing us to be born again, born from above, that God's Spirit comes and takes residence within us. We, we have a desire to want to live for the Lord. Before we were like, all the fish going downstream, and any dead fish can flow downstream. It takes a fish that's alive to fight against the current, to want to follow the Lord, to go upstream, to seek him, to, to live a life that would please him. And as we were in the Lord now, we're in the spiritual battle. We were oblivious to that before, right? But now we realize that there's darkness and there's light, right? There's, there's wickedness and deception and there's righteousness. So we realize that God has this work that he, only he can do in and through the heart 
to help us not be stiff-necked, but to be obedient to him through the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, next here in verse 17 through verse 22, we'll see that God is a God of love, and that should our praise should be on him and all about him. So we'll pick up here in, um, excuse me, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him. And to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things, which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven and multitude. We'll pause there. Moses reminds the people of the work that God has done for them. And he's instructed and teaches them the way that they should go. The question is, will the people listen and do what he says? As I thought about that, that's a question for us as well. Will we listen to the Lord and do what he says for us? We should know here in verse 17, it says that God cannot be bribed with our many words or our good deeds or be pacified by our disobedience to justify our actions. Well, Lord, you know my situation. I'm the exception to your command. I know you're said I'm supposed to love people, but you know, there's this one person, you would understand, Lord, I'm not gonna love them. And yet, God desires for us to be obedient to his word, to his command. And so we're to cut away the idols and the excuses from our hearts and, and not be willfully hard-hearted, resistant to what the Lord has. We see that God is our God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, that Jesus is awesome and powerful. He doesn't play favorites. He takes no bribes. He looks after widows and orphans, makes sure they're treated fairly. And he takes loving care of refugees, those that are seeking food and shelter. And he calls on Israel to do the same. They must treat foreigners with the same care. And remember that they were once foreigners in Egypt. And, and the reality is we too were separated from God by our sins. We were strangers. We were alienated foreigners, if you will. But God has rescued us. He's brought us into his family. And there we find shelter. We find all that we need in the Lord Jesus. And, and we're told this in the New Testament, and it, it's so true, that we love him because he first loved us. And God desires us to take that love and to share that with those around us. But it isn't a love that just happens. It's a love that we have to choose, a love that comes from the decision of setting our affection upon the Lord. And serving our God with all our heart and our soul means we do things in service unto him. Oh, that's caring for widows or orphans, for neighbors, for strangers, for coworkers, for um, extended family. Everything we do, we do in service unto the Lord. And that includes an attitude of showing that we're followers of Christ by the way that we're doing it represents the Lord. And I know everyone has gone through incredibly hard situations in life. Some experienced tragedy. Others passed over for a promotion on the job. Some people are stressed out by life and they're short fused with people and are uh, not always using the best of words to interact with people. And um, in those tough times, the only thing we can control is how we respond our attitude? Are we reflecting the love of the Lord? Are we his ambassador, his representative? Or are we conducting ourselves in a way that 
later on we would go back and look at and cringe a little like, oh, I can't believe I reacted that way. And as we walk with the Lord, we realize how to react instead of focusing on the problem. And that can be difficult, especially when you're going through something hard, but that's what needs to be done. And God's constantly reminding me, Tim, it's, it's not what you do, it's how you're doing it that matters. Because like anyone can do a job, anyone can do something, but it's how you're doing it that matters. And maybe you've had that situation, you're at a restaurant and um, there's somebody comes and they bring your food and, and the person's just like, here you go, when they leave, first of the person that comes and says, hey, how, how's the meal? Can I get you anything? You want some water? You need a refill? Everything tasted okay? Can I get you anything else? I'll come back in a few minutes and just double check and make sure things are going well. You begin to kind of see there's a person that is just doing their job for the paycheck and someone that's like, you know what? I'm going to actually show interest in other humans and, and care for them and, and do my job as unto the Lord, right? To do my job well and and you know, we have this term, Anna's reminding me of this, in the medical field, um, the doctors, there's doctors that are known to have a bedside manner, right? There's many doctors out there, but the ones that have a good bedside manner, it's basically those that are relatable, approachable. They're not cold and, and, and unresponsive. They're there with a heart of compassion. They're trying to explain things in a way that is understandable, right? To, to maybe even be that shoulder that you cry on as you're dealing with the, the blow of, of, of bad news, right? They're there, they're there to listen, they're there to help versus the person that says, here's the situation, take care, <laughs> you know? And so we begin to realize it's not necessarily what we're doing, it's how we're doing it that can matter for eternity. So we see that this is what Moses is reminding the people, and he, he says here in verse 22, he's reminding them that their fathers went down to Egypt, 70 people, but now, the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude. This would be a reminder of what Abraham saw, that he couldn't count the multitude of the stars in the heaven, yet God was going to multiply his descendants to be like that. And God is fulfilling that promise made all those years before. And, and, and God's the one who did it. God's the one who gets the glory. He's the one who should be our praise, the object of our praise. He alone is worthy. And I find that oftentimes when there's a lack of appreciation for what the Lord has done, it's almost always because there's a lack in obedience, a lack in reverence unto the Lord. So Moses is reminding the people of this, to have a heart that loves the Lord, a heart that praises, that worships, that is thankful for what he has done. In closing, when God commands something, the only way we can do it is if he enables us. Like when he commands us to love someone, we say, Lord, I can't love them. I need your help. Fill me afresh with your spirit. Help me to love this person, and at least enough to want to pray they come to know you as Savior and don't go to hell, right? Give me that heart, Lord, for people, that you died for everyone, and God will give us his heart. He will help us if we ask him. And so God commands them to do something, but it was only something he could do in them to show their need for him, to have this inner transformation, this inner work. And, and to compel them to seek him for this inner work, to return to the Lord, let him be first in your life and then watch him deliver and heal lives. So this is the inside job of the Holy Spirit. As our brother um, Wayne Carlson said, there's a song that we use in our audio podcast and our live stream broadcasting. Uh, he wrote this song, and in some of the lyrics in a song, he says, as I walk through this world in the journey of life, the Holy Spirit is pleading, wanting to work from the inside out, cleansing, changing, working things out, from the inside out, gently leading, transforming about, the fruit of love is the fruit that counts. God has changed our life from the inside out. Jesus is making us to be more like him as the Holy Spirit is pleading. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
But we ask that you would help us to be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit as you desire to make us more like you, as you desire to change and transform our hearts. Lord, we ask that we'd be yielded to you. And Lord, those times where we struggle and wrestle with, is that really you? Do you really want me to go and help that person? Lord, help us to realize that it's most likely you desiring to do that work. But I pray, God, you'd help us to ask you for help to do it. Knowing that we can't do the work of God and the energies and the strength of the flesh. So we ask, God, that you'd fill us afresh with your spirit. Empower us, Lord, to live a life that glorifies you. To love people as you do. To have this heart that loves you and a heart that loves others. We thank you, Jesus, for rescuing us, saving a wretch like us. We pray that we would grow an understanding of, of your love and your grace. And Father, we pray if there be anyone here this morning, whether in person or watching the live stream online or listening to this message later on, that Lord, if they need to surrender their life to you, we ask that today would be the day of salvation. And if you're here this morning, say, Pastor Tim, pray for me. Pray with me. I need to get right with God. I need to make sure that if I died today, I'd be with the Lord in heaven. I need my sins forgiven. I need that cleansing you're talking about. If that's you, I simply want to invite you to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. That you recognize he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And he wants to welcome you into his family and forgive you. If, the, if that's you, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, I realize that I'm a sinner. That my sin separates me from you. God, I believe that you love me. That Jesus, you came to die on the cross for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the grave. Lord, please forgive me of all my sins. I surrender all of my life to you. Help me from this day forward to follow you. And put your spirit within me that I may do your will. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for adopting me into your family. Thank you for being my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Christ or perhaps a rededication, let me know. I'd love to encourage you, pray with you, uh, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Mulder of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside